Dr. Ryan Stanton here with ASEP Frontline. Starting off today, ASEP 16 in Las Vegas, Nevada. And we're going to start off with a bang here uh, with Dr. Michael Bressler, who's got a couple of topics, a couple of talks on sepsis, as well as the articles that may change your practice. First, Dr. Bressler, thank you for joining us. Um, we are in the in the exhibition hall here, so you're going to hear some background noise, um, which is good. We want everybody to interact with us and let us know. Uh, listen now, and then when we have the podcast here released very soon. So, Dr. Bressler, tell me about yourself, where you're from, where you practice, and how you got interested in these topics that you're talking about. Well, I live in California. Uh, I'm a clinical professor of emergency medicine at Stanford, and also for years have uh, uh, worked in a nearby community hospital as well. So I combined both clinical practice and academic medicine. Uh, been involved with ASAP my whole life, basically, and uh, looking forward to doing this. All right. Sepsis. I think that's been a hot topic, a very significant topic that's been going around. We have a lot of information that we've been that's been pushed into the emergency department that says this is what we need to do, then all of a sudden we're finding stuff that says E, that's, that's, that's a one-stop shop fix-all. So what is the research saying right now in terms of sepsis? What are the articles saying? What are we finding out in terms of our treatment of sepsis in the emergency department? Yeah, it's, it's a real controversial topic. As we know for a number of years now, uh, the concept of sepsis has changed from what it used to be. Uh, and uh, we know the importance of early antibiotics, the importance of really massive fluid compared to what we used to do. Mm -hmm. But then the question is, what about patients with heart failure? What about um, renal failure? Uh, we know that there are various guidelines that we have to follow, um, but yet the guidelines, governmental guidelines, invariably have to lag several years bef behind the latest scientific findings. And so how does all of this fit? Well. One of the talks I'm giving is on the Sepsis 3 Task Force Report, the 2016 Sepsis 3 Task Force Report. Now, one of the motivations for this is, for example, let's say we've got a 22-year-old oh, woman that comes in, she's got a sore throat, got a temp of 39, respiratory rate of 22, heart rate of 95. Um, she's sitting there, you know, fingering her cell phone. Does she have sepsis? Yeah. According to the current definition, she, she has those criteria that would qualify her to at least consider strongly sepsis, and then depending on guidelines in your hospital or the government, would you call a sepsis code? Would you start getting blood cultures, um, you know, troponin, ZKG, give her 30 cc's per kilo of uh, IV fluid? So these are really the questions. In the real world, many patients that have surge criteria for whom we often trigger this massive and often, but not always appropriate, um, uh, a cascade of lab tests of treatment, et cetera, doesn't necessarily fit the real world. And so the, the 2016 Sepsis III International Task Force um, was uh, gathered to redefine what we do, what we think about sepsis, how we treat it. And that's a great, that's a great you brought up something there that I think challenges me in the emergency department because we're getting into flu season. So I practice in Lexington, Kentucky, and we are already seeing flu patients. Right. And every patient who comes in with H1N1 or even flu A for that matter, flu B doesn't tend to be as much, has the fever, has the tachycardia, right. has the tachypnea. But you're absolutely right. They're sitting there. They're a Facebook 10. I mean, they're the ones that are sitting there on their phones having a good time. They, don't, they feel poorly. They feel bad, but they're not septic. And so we're getting these, this patient meets sepsis criteria. Do we want to hit them with zosin, with mirapenem, with vancomycin? Do we want to hit them with the fluids? Sure, fluids and flu does tends to do pretty well. But as somebody now who feels like that we are just throwing out antibiotics like candy at Halloween, do we, where do we draw the line? Where is that clinical decision making for the physician's when it comes to these patients that meet SIRS criteria, but clearly on presentation, it's viral. Well, that's exactly the point. The whole revolution in treating sepsis has, has been extremely beneficial for those patients who really have it. The problem is it's caught a lot of people 
who don't have sepsis. And so um, in February of this year of 2016 in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, there were three landmark articles, the report of the Sepsis 3 task force. And the goals were to differentiate sepsis from uncomplicated infection, as you mm -hmm. mentioned, and then uh, to differentiate sepsis from septic shock. Now, true sepsis has at least a 10% mortality rate, and septic shock, 40% or more mortality rate. So these are really important questions, and particularly for us in emergency medicine, the front lines, when we see these patients entering into the healthcare system with this acute illness, we need to be able to differentiate these things. The old concept of sepsis, I mean, many years ago, was a life-threatening infection, but that has been modified in, in recent decade or so. Um, the old concept was that sepsis is caused by inflammation. Now, let's review the, the three articles mm -hmm. uh, in this landmark um, uh, uh, February 2016 uh, JAMA. The new concept is that sepsis triggers both pro- and anti-inflammatory uh, response to infection. Um, the, there were three principal recommendations of the task force. And by the way, this task force um, uh, included, uh, they, they looked at records from about 800,000 patients, both uh, U.S. and non-U.S. It was convened by the Society of Critical Care Medicine and the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. Um, and it was endorsed or uh, reviewed and endorsed by 31 international medical societies. So at any rate, let's look at what their principal recommendations were. To summarize, mm -hmm. the new definitions of sepsis and septic shock, which we'll go over in a few moments, elimination of the SERS criteria. Now that's really important. They recommended that's eliminating SERS criteria right. because they're neither sufficiently sensitive nor specific. Elimination of the term severe sepsis, because it's redundant. Um, and the terms septic, uh, uh, septicemia and sepsis syndrome. So the new definition of sepsis is like it used to be 20 years ago. This is a potentially life-threatening infection. And that's basically the concept. So they define sepsis now as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by an aberrant dysregulation of the host response that's, that is, it's the, it's, the injury is caused by our body's response to the infection, not the infection itself. The second article looks at septic shock. And so this was actually, it's a three-phase three study. The first was a systematic review of the literature to collate what are those criteria that are used in various articles and surveys and studies. Um, what's the cutoff uh, to define septic shock? And they found a huge variation. Um, no real great definition. Then they, had, they did a, a Delphi process uh, to try to find consensus as to which of these criteria really correlated to ultimate mortality. And they found three things. Hypotension with a mean arterial pressure of less than 65, a lactate greater than or greater than two, two or greater, and a need for vasopressor therapy. The third phase was then a prospective cohort study mm -hmm. um, looking to see these three criteria in various combinations. Did they correlate with ultimate mortality? And what they found was basically this, and this constitutes a new definition now of septic shock. Hypotension, that is a map less than 65 mm -hmm. after fluids, the requirement for vasopressor therapy to maintain that map, uh, and a lactate greater than two after adequate fluid resuscitation. And um, I think this will help us a lot in terms of defining what do we mean by septic shock. Now they found that there's higher mortality as the lactate went up, of course, but the difference between this and the new definition is a cutoff of lactate of two rather than four, but also the need for both uh, uh, the lactate and both vasopressor um, requirement and MAP uh, that's still low after after fluid resuscitation. And so when do we feel like this is going to impact clinical care? Because we have clearly here a fundamental shift in the approach, and yet the guidelines are still saying when they meet these criteria, criteria I'm supposed to hit them with 30 cc's per kilogram, and I'm supposed to hit them with the broad-spectrum antibiotics on very broad-based 
criteria? When will the guidelines match up with the new research? Excellent question. In other words, what do we do with this patient in front of us? Because now we have something that changes practice, but is in many ways contradictory to the mandates and guidelines that we currently have in the department. That's right. Well, the third study, the third article, um, was looking f- uh, for some trigger. What can we use? We've got this patient in front of us. Um, we've gotten a history. Um, uh, we have a, r- a rough idea of what's going on. Is there something we, we have traditionally, or at least in the last 10 or 15 years, used the SERS criteria, let's say a triage. Mm-hmm. Is there another modality that we can use that um, since they're throwing out SERS or recommending that we throw out SERS, is there another modality that we can use that um, will help us? Well, they looked, the third article then looked at various things. They looked at SERS, they looked at the uh, SOFA, S-O-F-A, which stands for the Sequential Organ Failure Mm -hmm. Assessment, loads, uh, logistic organ dysfunction system, things that we don't really use, and then a modification of SOFA, a new rapid test that can be used at triage. Now, what they, I'm just going to talk about the non-ICU aspects of, right, of right, this third article. Yeah. So for non-ICU, including the emergency department, they felt that the Q SOFA, that is the modified SOFA, was predictive of in-hospital mortality. And what does that mean? That means a respiratory rate of 22 or more, a GCS of 13 or less, and systolic pro- blood pressure of 100 or less. And any two of those three trigger is correlated with significant increase in inhospital mortality, and they recommended that instead of SERS at triage before you do anything else, that if those two of those three criteria were found, this is what we should trigger our, our, our significant response. Now, it's not specific for infection, of course, of course, but they found that that correlates more with mortality than SERS. Well, I think they, it, it, more and more this is, throw, this is putting judgment into the physician's hand saying, this is what you have. These are our guidelines. But now you have to wade through the weeds and find the actual bacterial sepsis patient and figure that one out That's and right. hit it. Because we have, we do have to figure out how to be better stewards of antibiotics. We right. can't be throwing our zosins and our mirapenems at everybody who walks through the door with flu. But at the same time, we don't want to miss we don't want to miss that bacterial sepsis who comes in um, to the emergency department. In my department, my average patient seems to be about 112 years old. It may not be accurate, maybe a little bit less than that, but it seems to be that way. Thus, I don't want to hit every one of them with 30 cc's per kilogram. They've already got three plus four plus pitting edema, or Granny may weigh. 80 pounds in a rainstorm with a park on. The weighing this out is, is difficult, and I think that the attempts to clarify it over the last few years have actually made it more challenging on physicians, making the stakes higher while at the same time not necessarily differentiating it out a bit. Well, that's exactly right. The, the whole sepsis movement... Um, has been very beneficial for those people that actually have it. And the criteria we use have, have really increased our sensitivity to picking up these people um, at the expense of specificity. So we've included in this net a lot of folks who really, mm-hmm. it may be inappropriate to do that. Now the question though, and you kind of hinted at this, is how is this going to affect our practice? Well, it's interesting um, because the the new definition just came out and was just published in February, and of course ICD-10 has different, uh, quite different definitions. Uh, the uh, centers, the uh, Government Center for uh, Medicaid and Medicare Services, uh, CM, uh, you know, uh, does not recognize this yet, <laughs> obviously. And of course, JCA, the Joint Commission uh, on Accreditation of Health Organizations, doesn't recognize it. So what do we do? Well, it's going to be a while um, before all of this ent- is going to affect the government regulations, our hospital regulations, perhaps the malpractice environment. There will be a lag. And unfortunately, one of the problems with regulation that we necessarily have to uh, accommodate these days often lags scientific findings. And this is going to be frustrating for us for a few years. Um, these definitions will eventually, I think, I hope, 
uh, make their way into regulation, but they have not yet. And so I think it's important to work out in our own hospitals exactly how do we want to approach this? Um, how do we want to take into account the new sepsis-3 guidelines and yet still not run afoul of the regulations? It's going to be a balancing act, but, but I'm optimistic about the future. Well, the key is physicians out there, PAs, nurse practitioners, is still the main focus is that early recognition an aggressive early therapy. So if you suspect it, if you pick it up, if you screen it, you pick it up, the antibiotics, the fluids, whatever the, that patient needs to get them resuscitated, that's definitely shown to lower the, mort the morbidity and mortality. So we need to, the key here is still that early recognition, bringing in these tools, understanding the guidelines that are still there, keeping your ear to the rail because it will change. And I have a feeling that we will have more data and more changes as soon as they pick those up. It's almost like the idea behind a textbook to a journal article right. to a podcast to the social media in terms of the speed stuff is disseminated out. Which you know, is why we're doing a podcast. Absolutely. Remember, your test is 10 <laughs> yeah. years out. Your podcast is now we're talking about stuff from 2016. You're also talking about some of the other articles outside of sepsis that are going to change our practice. What do we need to know for this year when we go back, we leave Las Vegas, Nevada, or wherever you may be in the country or around the world, when you go back to practice, what's changing this year? Well, there are three things, uh, or several things that, that, that I've looked at uh, in the articles since the last scientific assembly uh, last year. One of the questions that uh, uh, was asked is, is uh, coronary artery CTA sufficient to allow us to discharge a patient from the emergency department, mm -hmm. a low-risk patient, not somebody we really think has an acute coronary syndrome we're going to admit to the hospital, no question, but those people that we might want to put on an observation unit or might want to send to stress echo if we can get it expeditiously, can we use CTA instead to discharge these people from the hospital? And one of the articles from, uh, I believe, September of uh, last year by Hollander and his group in the annals um, looked at this issue and... Um, they basically, uh, it was a trial um, to ask that question. There was about 1,400 patients in five centers, again, with criteria such that you didn't want to necessarily send them out, right. you weren't going to put them in the hospital, this sort of intermediate risk, a really low risk, low to intermediate risk criteria. And um, uh, the entrance criteria involved a TIMI score of zero to two, so it's relatively low risk, but mm -hmm. not, you know, you're not comfortable sending them out. Um, and it was really an excellent um, study. They looked, of course, at the patients. Um, they surveyed them at 30 days in one year. They looked at hospital records to make sure they didn't miss anything, um, with permission, assumingly. They um, also looked, if they couldn't find the patient, they uh, looked at neighboring hospitals to see if they presented well, there. Yeah. And then they went so far as to look at the official death records if they couldn't contact the patient and see, well, did these patients die? So really interesting. That's never a place you want to find your patient. Oh, absolutely not. No. <laughs> but they... they I examined several criteria. Was there a difference in all in all cause mortality, in cardiac mortality, uh, major adverse cardiac events, uh, AMI, need for revascularization between patients who were treated in the standard way versus CT angiography? And they found no difference. They looked at was there a change in hospital admissions or ED presentations, um, visits to a cardiologist? No difference. Also, how about in testing or in medication use? No difference. And so their conclusion was, yes, in those low-risk low patients, zero to two TIMI score, um, CTA is sufficiently sensitive to allow discharge from the emergency department of those patients who we might otherwise have admitted to a short-stay unit mm -hmm. um, and tested um, uh, perhaps with, with serial troponins, uh, EKGs, and um, uh, uh, an echo stress test, for example. The question I always have with that study and with the CTAs of the chest, I mean, it's a very high radiation test, is where do we draw that line in terms Good of question. that? We don't want the lowest of low risk. A 12-year-old who comes in with chest pain after getting hit in the chest with a baseball, we're not going to scream them over to the CT scanner sure. and do a, do the study. And so figuring out that, you know, the 35-year-old female with chest pain or the 42-year-old male, negative troponins, eight hours of chest pain, relatively low risk, and we have to, where do we draw that line? And I think that's yeah. where the next stage of studies when it comes to the CTA is how do we call that back 
to not be throwing radiation around at everybody who comes in that apartment. That's always an issue with, with radiologic studies, particularly CT. You know, a number of years ago, no, not too distant past, they were setting up CT angiography centers and shopping centers. You know, you could do your shopping, uh, you know, go to the supermarket, whatever. Uh, oh, yeah, let's uh, go get a CTA, see if I've got calcifications. Now, that, of course, is, I can't use profanity here, but believe in the, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> differences. This is a whole different thing. The technology has changed over the years so that actually the radiation is much, much less than it used to be. And it's felt that that relatively low radiation now with gated CTA, the way the radiologists mm -hmm. have refined it now, it's a, it's a relatively uh, low risk mm -hmm. procedure. But again, it has to be clinically correlated. You know, these are people that not just, oh, well, let's just get a CTA. These are people right. you would have not discharged from the ED. Okay. What else we got? Well, we got something on pulmonary embolus. Um, oh, good. Can, That's same thing on CT. Yes. Can we do the opposite? Can we avoid getting a CT angiogram in patients that we think may have a pulmonary embolus or not? And so um, uh, an article in the February uh, annals by Sharp and um, uh, colleagues looked at this issue, and um, they used age-adjusted the uh, um, uh, D-dimer. For example, beginning at age 50, D-dimer 500. Age 60, 600. Age-adjusted D-dimer to see if this, in fact, um, would allow us, is sufficiently sensitive to allow us to avoiding the radiation mm -hmm. of uh, CT angiogram in these people. And um, they found it um, to compared with a the standard 500 uh, nanograms per deciliter value, that age-adjusted was, a, of course, somewhat less sensitive, but it was much more um, specific, and they could avoid um, uh, angiography in quite a few patients. They found basically uh, about a 93% sensitivity rate, about a 64% specificity, which we would expect. The question is, we're going to miss some. Right. Are those clinically significant? Yes. And they felt that no. Um, that's the, there, that's the next line I think we draw in pulmonary embolism. It's just like trauma. We can find stuff, but does that stuff matter that's in the right. end? So on 31,000 patients, they missed 26 PEs. And they estimated that it would have prevented 322 cases of contrast-induced nephropathy, 29 cases of severe renal failure from the dye, and 19 deaths related to contrast-induced Nephropathy. Now, this wasn't the finding of the study. Mm -hmm. This was their estimate the based on their miss rate of 26 out of 31,000. And so they are basically saying um, that, yes, that um, beginning age 50, using a, an age-adjusted criteria of 500, you know, the age times 10, that it is sufficiently sensitive um, uh, in low-risk patients. Now, if you really think, boy, the clinically this is a PA, The tachycardic, no. uh, the yes, low yes. blood pressure, the... Exactly, yeah. yeah. And they say that this, in fact, supports um, ASEP's Choosing Wisely campaign, which recommends not doing angiography in patients with a negative PERC score or a negative uh, D-dimer. Absolutely. All right, Dr. Bressler, thank you so much for your time. Great articles out there. Check them out. Dig deep into them because these will be practice changing for you. Will affect the lives of our patients. How can folks get in touch with you if they have more questions, either uh, whether by social media or via email? Sure. Uh, my email is mbressler, M-B-R-E-S-L-E-R, -E that's one S, mbressler at stanford.edu. Be glad to uh, uh, communicate with anyone who has some other uh, interests. And, and the lecture we'll be giving in a few days. So if you're listening to this once we release it, you're going to need a follow-up, whether through virtual ASAP or uh, checking out the articles yourself. You can contact me, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. Also, at Everyday Med on Twitter. We also have the ASAP Frontline Facebook page. Join that. We'll let you know whenever we have a new podcast, which is going to be once a week from this time forward. So every week you'll get a new podcast right there delivered to your uh, mobile device or wherever you like to listen to it. As for me, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton. Thanks for joining me. Join me next time for ASAP Frontline. <music>